Okay, so um, this part is going to show you how to actually make a grid in InDesign. Um, and also, how to create a workflow that's going to work for you. So basically, um, I just have a question for you guys. How many of you guys are using InDesign for your portfolios? Is anyone using Photoshop or Illustrator? Wow. <laughs> Usually I get about half and half. So for those of you guys who are using Photoshop and Illustrator, um, InDesign is something that I think is going to help you guys out a lot. Um, and <clears throat> I'm just going to go over our goals for today so you know exactly what to expect. Um, in case you want to leave. <laughs> so the first thing that we're going to do is um, we're going to learn how to set up master spreads. If you don't know what a master spread is, you should definitely stay. Um, I'm going to teach you how to place images quickly um, and also adjust your images when they're in InDesign by using your layer options. Um, I'm going to show you how to flow text with formatting from Word into InDesign. Um, I'm going to show you how to place and typeset your text using character styles and paragraph styles. Again, just like master pages, if you're not using character and paragraph styles, I highly recommend that you stay. Um, and then I'm going to teach you how to package and print your document. When you guys um, package and you send out a PDF, how many of you guys, I just want to take a quick survey, how many of you guys use high quality print? How many of you guys use um, press quality? How many of you guys use PDF X4 2008? All right, you all have to stay. <laughs> and you all have to come to color management. <laughs> use PDF X4 2008. <laughs> I know, it's a trick. It's really like a hidden thing. But the point is, is I think you're going to learn something. Um, so why do you use InDesign? Um, I work with publishers, I work with Fiden, I work with Thames and Hudson, um, I work with um, the printers that Pentagram uses in the city. Um, everyone pretty much uses InDesign. It's the industry standard. It's fully compatible with the other Adobe programs. So when you're working in Photoshop and Illustrator, um, there are certain options that you can use that aren't available in other layout programs. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but it's also compatible with Microsoft Word. I'm just putting a disclaimer out there. This morning when I tried it, it wasn't compatible. <laughs> Sometimes, because it's two different companies, they have to catch up on their technology, but we're going to try it. Um, also, versus Photoshop or Illustrator, the main difference is that InDesign creates a link to your file. In Photoshop, your artwork is embedded in the file. And so if you think about it, what that does is it allows you to view your entire document and lay out more than you would in the other programs. Because the memory in InDesign is not going to actually embedding the artwork in your project, but it's in the file, but it's actually going towards creating this layout and then the actual images have um, that memory embedded in them. Um, so basically, it allows you to see your entire document in one screen. Um, and then the links and export options, they, we're not going to go over this, but like it allows you to reformat it for other types of media. So a lot of people now, the challenge is they're like, OK, I'm creating something um, that needs to be a book, a website. It has to be on a tablet. It has to be seen on a phone. And so basically, like. InDesign has a liquid layout that you can use to um, use the same file to produce it for other types of media. <clears throat> OK, so master pages. What is a master page? Um, think of it like a template. So what it typically contains, it's a spread. Um, it's separate from your layouts. And uh, a lot of times, it'll contain graphics, um, frames for both your text and your images, guides, the settings for your margins and columns. Um, and the power of a master is that when you adjust any of what these elements in the master spread, it automatically adjusts them in your layouts. And so you can do broad sweeping changes across your entire document just by adjusting one spread. So I'm going to show you. Um, 
This is a project that I did. It was super quick while I was at GSAP. Um, and I just use it because it's a 10 page portfolio spread. Um, the portfolio spread is super simple. It's not super designed, but it's more just here to illustrate some of our points. So I'm not saying design your portfolio like this, <laughs> but um, just to give you an idea of our objective, we're gonna lay this out. Yeah, it was a very, I was feeling very confident when I made this project. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into InDesign, um, and what I, I want to create a new document. So I click File, New Document. I'm going to set my intent to print. Um, it's 10 pages. Um, and then I click OK. And then you can see my entire document here. A couple of things for tips for you guys. Graphic designers work in points. Um, architects work in inches. So um, for architects, I always recommend you go to preferences. Uh, I use a Mac, so excuse me if I'm a little slow sometimes. Um, and I just adjust my units to inches. If you know how to use points, great. Um, but if not, go ahead and make that move. Um, the other thing that I do is I zero out my document. So I take the zero point. It's just standard practice, and I put it in the top left-hand corner. Um, it's usually preset that way, but you never know. And then just like Illustrator and Photoshop, InDesign has layers. I use a structure of five layers. So mine is uh, guides. Backgrounds. master elements, images, and text. So it's important that your text layer is always on top. And I'm going to show this to you towards the end of the tutorial. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to make a grid. I'm going to pop into one of my spreads, and I want a six by six grid. So to create that, I go to layout, margins, and columns. And in my margins and columns, this is where I set my columns. Um, I'm going to say that I want six and then to create my rows, I do it a little differently. I go to layout, create guides. And you'll see here, I hit six. You can change your gutter, the distance between the columns here. This is important. So in your options, it says fit guides to margins or page. I want to fit it to my margins. That means it's going to be the, between the pink and the pink. If I say page, it's actually going to fit them outside of my margins, and it's not going to create a grid. If you wanted to break the grid, then go ahead. It's, it would be intentional when you chose page. And then I always click Remove Existing Ruler Guides. You'll notice, actually, I didn't highlight this page to create my column, so I'm going to do that now. OK, so I have a 6 by 6 grid. OK, so there are two ways that I can set up my master pages. Um, I'm going to show you one really quickly. So you'll see that my page um, window is divided in two. The top is my masters, and the bottom is my spreads. So the easiest and fastest way to create a grid, if you're kind of working on something, if you have, I mean, a master page, if you like it, is just to select your spreads and drag them up here. So that's one way. Oh, wait. Well, I'll do that again so I can show you. So if I click here, you'll see that this master is blank. This one has my columns and grids. OK, I want to show you the other way. So that's just to create it from, so the other way is just to create it from scratch. So actually, I'm not going to do that because it's going to, we're sort of pressed for time. OK, cool. Um, so what I'm going to do, is in, in this master, 
I'm going to create a generic layout. So I'm going to look at my first page. And what I have here is I have one large text box, and I have an image box and an image box. So in this master, what I want is a text box. So I go make sure I'm on my right layer, and I draw my text box in. And then I have two image boxes, image frames. Sorry, not boxes. So I'm going to draw those in. And you'll see the difference between master elements and regular elements is in my master. If it were regular, it would appear as a solid line. If it's a master, it appears as a, this little dotted line. So one thing I want to point out to you guys is smart guides. I don't know if you've used these, but if you notice when I drag this down, all of a sudden, all these green arrows show up on my um, layout. What that's telling me is it's telling me that everything and that's indicated in the horizontal and everything that's indicated in the vertical with those green arrows is the same size. I love smart guides. They drive some people crazy. If you want to turn them off, just go to guides and grids and turn off smart guides. So. One thing about masters is parent and child. Um, the parent contains all of the elements in common with the children. <laughs> it used to be called master slave <laughs> about five years ago. Adobe has really done a good job of polishing up their act. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's so embarrassing. Um, but basically, the parent and the child, which is equally as weird, um, the parent and the child. Um, it comes from computer science. I just want to throw it out there. It what? Both of those terms come from computer science. Oh, they do? Okay. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what I'm going to do here is. Um, this is the terminology, actually, is to create, I'm going to create a child. <laughs> so to create a child, I right click on my master. And what I want to say is new master. So here I'm giving it the prefix. Oh, this is a little weird. Hold on just a second. Let me rename this one. You can, one thing that's nice is you can go to your master options. I'm going to call it A because it's simpler. You can call it A. Um, and you can do all sorts of things. Like you can assign color labels to these if you get really complex. Um, it's really convenient. So basically, now I'm going to create a child. So I click New Master. And then what I want to do is I want to base my new master B on my A master. So I'm going to click A master. And you'll see here. When I click on my child, basically it has all the same elements in common. So let's say I go to my A master and I want to change this text, this image frame. When I do that, it automatically changes it in the child. So all of the um, all of the elements that are in common are linked. So right now, I'm going to take a look and see what has changed in that spread. And basically what happened was I added an image frame, and then I reduced that text frame. So I'm going to come back to my child, and it just weirds me out every time I say it. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the images layer, and I'm going to add an image frame to compensate for that extra image. And then what I want to do is you'll notice that because this is in the child and it's referring to the parent, it's locked. I can't adjust it. So I need to unlock it. What I can do is one of two things. You can go here, you can right click, and you can say override all master page items. What that's going to do is make everything on your spread that's part of the parent editable. But when you go back to the parent, it's not going to adjust it if you adjust the parent. What you can do instead is a shortcut. I think on a PC it's, 
Yeah, it's control shift. So when you hit control shift, it'll release an individual element on your master spread so that you can edit it. So basically what I wanna do is make that text frame smaller. And then um, I wanna create one more. This one, I created it by duplicating the child. So now it still refers back to A. I want it to have refer back to um, B. So I'm gonna go to master options. I'm gonna have it based on my B master. And then here, you'll see what I have are basically two images at the bottom. It's super simple. I'm just going to do my trick with Control-Shift and delete out the frames I don't need. And I'm good to go. So let's go to the layouts. Um, so you can notice here, I always get this question. Um, Basically, you have all these layouts, but you can't move the pages so that it starts. It, it, the default is to start with a title page, because most books start with a title page. But sometimes in your portfolio, you want to start with a spread, like in my instance. So to override that, I'm going to select all my pages. I right click, and I deselect this option, allow document pages to shuffle. So what you can do now is add, move, change single pages, which I wasn't able to do before. So I want to import my master spreads onto and apply them these spreads. So basically, this is my A. And you'll notice on your spreads, you get a little um, icon in the right in the left corner. That's telling you which of your masters is applied to these spreads. If I want to do this in a faster way, what I can do is right click on my master, say apply master to pages. You can do all, um, you can do whatever you want to do. So I'm going to apply this one to five and six, and then this one to seven through 10. Now I'm ready to start importing. So I'm going to run back here, and I think I have a diagram and an image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start importing my diagram. Um, so I hit Control D, which is place. I select the image. I click Open. And then I click. You can notice as I hover, there's a black arrow, and then it turns to white. I want to have it hover over the frame, and it turns to white. When it turns to white, that means it's going to drop it in. So you'll see when I double click onto the image, basically what happens is that some of it is being cut off. Um, there's a, an automated feature for this. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to reverse my decision. And I'm going to go back to my master spread. So if I right click here and I go to fitting, it says frame fitting options. What I want to do here is I want to have all of my image scaled and contained in that frame and centered. So the option that I want to choose here is I want to choose fit content proportionally. That means that it's going to fit all of the content proportionally even my, in, in my frame, even if there's white space or blank space left over. So I also want it to be centered. So you can see here you can adjust the position where it aligns. I'm going to click in the center. Now when I go back, this is the power of the master. I can go back to my design sketch. When I drop it in, All of it fits. So likewise, when I go to drop this photo in, you'll notice if I drop it in, not all of the photo, it's getting cropped. You know, there's too much photo for the frame. So this one I want to go back and make a similar adjustment. This is better for photos when you want to fill the entire frame. 
I go to fitting, frame fitting options. I click fill frame proportionally. I center it. That means it's going to fill the entire frame, but keep my image proportional. So if I run back here, I click on my image. And then it fills it proportionally. So here, in my next spread, again, I have a little bit of an anomaly, anomaly because I have an entire um, image that takes up the page. I'm going to do my trick. I'm going to override my master element and just make a larger image frame. Hit Control D to place it. And then place my material studies very quickly. And then on my last spread of images, um, again, place a diagram. So since I've already indicated that this is supposed to be the diagrams, which always appear on the top, are supposed to be fit, um, the content is fit proportionally in the image. It should come in since it's in my master. And now I have a little bit of a different situation where I have a series of images and I want to import them quickly. So you'll see that I've numbered them here um, in a sequential order. I'm going to select all of them, click open, and there's a little arrow there that says 23. That means I have 23 images to place. So if I were just to drag this, you'll see how it's not quite proportional. When I click shift, it allows me to draw the text, the image box to whatever I want it to be. So basically, as I move on, I'm using my smart guides. They're telling me everything's the same size, almost. And I can keep going. In the interest of time, I'm not going to lay all of them out, but you can see how you can import multiple images at the same time. And then we come down here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the last page. So let's see. I have one file here. Um, whoops, wrong Photoshop file. This one. So this one, I have a filter placed on my image. So I've added an, ad added an adjustment layer. And in that adjustment layer is a black and white filter. I haven't quite decided whether I want to use black and white or color in my photos. So I want to keep it open-ended. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Show Import Options, because you can see here it's saved in black and white. So a dialog box opens. This is the same as um, Illustrator. Basically, if you have a file with multiple layers, you're able to turn them on and off when you import the image, and then also when you get it into InDesign. So right now, I've decided I want to do color, so I'm going to click off my filter layer, I'm going to drop the image and place it. And so I'm sort of like coming down to the wire of my portfolio, and it's, I like the black and white feel a lot more. If I right click, click this image and go to Object Layer Options, I can go back and change that layer to be on again. So you don't actually have to export JPEGs for all of your work. You can use working files and turn layers on and off in InDesign, which is really useful. OK, so let's go ahead and transition into text now. Let's see if this will work. So I have a text file. I place it the same way I place my images, Control D. I also have clicked Show Import Options. So you'll see here I have a ton of different options. I've actually formatted my text in Word, and I want to keep that. 
I have the option here to remove all the styles and formatting, but I have page breaks and I want for my text to be flowed in with the page breaks um, so that basically I can sort of let the text flow from text frame to text frame. I'll show you in just a minute. So I'm going to keep that on. I'm going to click OK. It looks like I don't have the fonts. Oh, no, that's my project schedule. <laughs> Hold on. Wow, something is different. Okay, give me just one second, guys, sorry. While I'm looking for this, do you guys have any questions? Does it seem pretty clear? Okay, I'm going to just pull this up on my email. Um, never. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually a really good point. I think, you know, making a book is a very iterative process. Um, and it's also a guessing game. I think you have to sort of like, and this is probably true for your portfolio as well, you kind of have to guess your content um, and make educated decisions about what it's gonna be and how you're gonna, how you're gonna be able to do the layouts. And also like, you know, keep an attitude of flexibility so that when you, you know, when something doesn't necessarily fit as it's planned, you have, <laughs> excuse me, your grid or, your layout is flexible enough that you can accommodate it. And editing, editing text down. Okay, so I'm gonna try to place this again. Great, better. Um, so you can see here what's happening is that I've added page breaks into my Word document. And when I clicked formatting, keep those page breaks, what it's doing, I have a little red plus mark down here, that indicates that there's more text. So where that text, that page break occurs, it's actually asking me to flow it into another text frame. If I click that plus mark, you'll see I get a little icon with text. I come down, I place it the same way I place images, and again, I get the same message, and I can go to my third text frame. So the nice thing is with Word is that you can edit your text and then reflow it back. You can save it and reflow it. It, it updates like an image file updates. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is that if you notice in my layout, I have two columns of text here. So I want to go ahead and create those two columns. So when I click on my text frame, there's an icon up here and it says one. It looks like, like really bad columns. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click two. And what that does is it gives me two columns of text without having to draw two text frames. So why is this useful? Um, because... Let's say I have a really long title that's going to span between two text frames. So if I had two separate text frames, it wouldn't allow me ever to cross. But when I have these, um, these two joined, when I go to my paragraph tab,
there's an option here called span columns. What I want to do is I want to say span columns, highlight the text I want to span across my columns. It's going to ask me how many. I'm going to click all. When I click preview, you can see that it actually allows that title to cross all the way across the two columns. And actually, I also want this return to do the same thing. So then I get a nice title. So one thing that you guys might, I use all the time and you guys might want to start using, in fact I advise it, are character styles and paragraph styles. So what is a style? How many of you guys are using those right now? Okay, so about a third. Basically, if we think back to the master, it's along the same lines. When I set a character style, basically I'm telling, I'm creating a style that's dictating the color of the font, anything that I want, the underline options, um, the font, the fit typeface that I'm using, the size, the letting, all of those things. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you the power of using this. I'm going to create a character style. I go to Window, Character Styles. If I highlight this text and I just click New, it's going to create a character style for what I'm using. So you'll see here it says Garamond. Sometimes you have to input this information yourself. I want to use 11, 14 letting. Great. I'm just going to apply it to my whole document right now. I usually do that for any text as I just go ahead and apply it. Now, I want to create one for my title. So basically, it's going to base it on my character style one. So any of the shared characteristics between the character styles, when I change my text to character style one, it'll affect this as well. I just want this to be bigger. And then I have this guy. So this is my subtitle. And I want this to be a little bit bigger. OK, so let's say I'm really indecisive about my portfolio. It's like not due for a couple months. I haven't really decided on a typeface, but I need to get things moving. What I can do is in the character styles, I'm going to go back. I want, instead of a serif font, I want a sans serif. So let's do something that is kind of illegal and use Arial for print. Um, <laughs> it's just a typography joke. <laughs> so I'm going to use Arial. And you'll see that when I change this, it automatically changes all of the text in my document. Oh, whoops, I need to apply subtitle to this guy. So let's say I want to go back to a serif font for my subtitles, but that's the only one. I can pop in here and I can go back to Garamond's. Wow, this has got a lot of fonts. And then I can change my subtitles back to Garamond. So you can imagine, this is a pretty small um, spread, but a lot of your portfolios are going to be hundreds of pages long. And when you're dealing with that and you want to change something, and you're, um, you want to change something, one of these small um, tweaks, it's just a blanket way to change it all at once instead of going in and surgically changing it one by one. Super useful. So some things that I just want to point out to you guys that are very useful, they're shortcuts um, in your paragraph style, is that you'll learn all about the uh, do's and don'ts of these things tomorrow in the typography lecture. But one of them is when you have a rag right, which means that the edge of your 
um, justification is ragged. Um, you can have certain moments like here and here where it's really jagged. And what you want to do is um, go into your paragraph tab, do your drop down. There's something called balance ragged lines. So typographers spend like weeks and weeks and maybe months, if it's a long book, adjusting all of these manually. What InDesign done, has done is it's given you an algorithm where basically it balances that rag on your right so that it's pleasing to the eye. So I'm gonna click balance ragged lines and you can see how it fixed that area right there that I'd indicated that it was a little bit problematic. The other thing is, is let's say, I have to create this. So, so here, this is super awkward. Um, these are widows and orphans. Widows, I forgot, oh, a widow is when there's one line that's left at the top of a column. An orphan is one word that's left at the end of a line, at the end of a paragraph. So I'm gonna tackle um, this widow. <laughs> God. <laughs> Am I gonna get arrested? <laughs> so basically, um, for this one, I'm gonna go to keep options. When I click, kick, click keep options, what I wanna do is I wanna keep lines together. So here, what I can do is I can say how many lines have to stick together. I think usually um, I try to keep three and it's not working. <laughs> Great. Yeah, usually, I don't know why it's not working. It might be something to do with the title but usually it will keep the two, automatically keep the two lines together. Um, so we'll skip that. <laughs> um, then the last thing I want to show you guys is um, text wrapping. So in here I have that um, kind of funny moment where like it wraps around an image. So I'm gonna go ahead and this is why you need to keep your text on the top and your images below. I'm gonna drop that image into this. Um, I've clipped it out. I'm gonna drop it in the center here. And I want the text to wrap around the image. So if I go to the text wrap window what I want to do is um, have the, te the text wrap around the object shape. There are all kinds of options here. You can have it around the bounding box. I want it to be that sort of like sh um, look where it's like around the shape. So I'm going to click around the shape. And then what I'm going to do is come down here and say um, detect edges. So it's going to detect the edges and draw a little line around my shape. And then I want it to be an eighth of an inch. And it adds a little bit of cushioning. And so I'm able to do a text wrap. But if my text went below it, it wouldn't work. So packaging your document. How do you get this off to your printer? <clears throat> so the first thing that I always recommend is as soon as you start working on your portfolio, start looking for a printer because you can start having a discussion with them about how they want to receive the document, what page sizes they can work with, how long it's going to take. It's a, they'll give you a production schedule, how the binding's going to work, how many pages you can do for the binding. Just start your conversation now. Um, but if I save this, What I can do is I can package a file. So when I package a file, it gives me a folder. 
And inside that folder, I have my InDesign file. I have a file that is um, a folder that is all of my links. So it copies all of those image files from wherever they exist, on my hard drive, on my cloud, on my phone, whatever. It copies all of those, a copy of all those images into a links folder. Um, because if you do move, one thing I should mention is if you move, a, if you move one of those image files out of its location, in InDesign, it's going to lose that link and it won't package it. So when you package it all together, it packages it with the link, so it comes as a package. <sighs> so it's a package so many times. <laughs> and it also puts your font files in there. So when your printer opens this file, he's basically able to get download the fonts, get your image files, you can add special instructions, you can add a PDF to it, you can add an InDesign file that's a different version of InDesign, an IDML. Um, but typically this is how they're going to ask for it. So I click package. You can see I can put instructions in my contact info. I'm just going to do an untitled folder. And then when I go back in here, um, it's right here. So I've got fonts, links, I've got my InDesign. Um, when you export it, that window, it gives you an option for a PDF or an IGML. So last two things. One of them is what happens when you're missing a link file. So basically, I'm going to pop in here. I'm going to botch this and just totally, I'm going to take one of these files out. OK. When I go to my links panel, it's going to give me like an update on all of my links and whether they're active or not. So this one, oh, that one didn't get imported. This is one of the ones we missed. <laughs> OK, let's try this again. Um, this one I know is in here. OK, so now. You'll see that it's giving me a warning sign, but saying that that is missing. I double click on it. I go find it. I relink. I'm good to go. If you have, um, if you have saved over the file, it has to update in InDesign um, before you print it or you package it, or it won't print it or package it. If that happens. Um, you're going to get this warning sign. It's like an like a, um, exclamation point in a triangle, and it's going to appear beside your image. All you have to do is double click, and it's going to update that link. Now, the last tip is I realize that a lot of you guys are probably going to be putting together, let's take, for example, last night, the abstract book, where there were basically... Um, like the big chunks were five different designs for a book. So it doesn't really make sense to do all of those designs in one InDesign file. Also, if you're doing a book that's like um, a portfolio that's like 200 pages, you're going to max out your memory, um, especially with some of the drawings that come out of the school. So one of the ways to manage this is that you create um, InDesign files for chunks of your book, maybe chapters, maybe projects, whatever it is. Um, and what you can do is you can create a book file. And the book file allows you to export a PDF or it allows you to, it does a couple things. You can export a PDF, um, you can package all of it, um, you can print all of it, um, and you can also control the character and paragraph styles for all of the files in that book through one of your files. So just to demonstrate how to do that, I need to copy over, oh, actually, I think I have two InDesign files here. It's really simple. I go to New Book. And here, it gives me the option to add documents. So I'm going to add this one. Unfortunately, this one has the same name. <laughs> this one's just going to be untitled, even more anonymous. 
Okay. So I've got my book file. It's got sequential page numbering. So also if you do automatic page numbering, it's going to automatically number your pages correctly. Um, you'll see here this little icon um, that is indicating which of your files is holding the character and paragraph styles for the rest of the book. So right now, if I wanted to change my paragraph styles for the entire book, I would go to Untitled 1 and change them in that file, save it, and it will update all of your other files. So maybe one final like half thing, um, and that is page numbering. Um, since I just mentioned it. So basically, page numbering is super simple. All you do is make sure you do it in your master. So you create a text frame. And then you go to type, special character, Markers, current page number. Make sure that you apply your character style to these two. Then I'll hop into my text frame options, and I actually can center that text in the text frame. So it drops from the top to the center. And then when you look at your layouts, you'll see there's one, there's three, there's five, there's seven.